Welcome to Stereo 3D Productions. Folks, grab a coffee, pop a few speed pills. This is going to be a long one, but it's a long overdue service from my part. For a long time now on this channel, I've been playing games that don't support virtual reality using a tool called Vorpex to enable said virtual reality. A few of these games have gone as far as being featured in their own Let's Play series. During such series, I developed the tradition of doing detailed demonstrations of my configurations. I'd even completely redo these demonstrations end-to-end -end several times throughout a given series in order to update the process as it was improved. While it's a great thing that I'm sharing all those settings as clearly as I can, as frequently as I can, the problem here is management, both for me and the viewer. As these settings demonstrations multiply, all scattered across my various Let's Play series. For example, Fallout 4 has 5 tutorials in the series, parts 1, 5, 9, 10, and 16. It's become quite difficult for me to make it clear to viewers which tutorial is the latest, correct one, and it's also become tricky for viewers to even find the tutorials hidden in the series in the first place. This brings us here. We're starting a new series specifically for Vorpex game configurations. And it's going to be far better organized than the tutorial scatter that's been building up recently. No more will I eat up lengthy chunks of Let's Play episodes every five parts to stop and do a tutorial. Instead, you'll find all the new format tutorials in this series here. And we'll have a clear way of linking old tutorials to newer, more up-to-date tutorials. Videos that get updated in this series will see the old version have the tag outdated between brackets in the title. If you see this in the title, check the description for a link to the updated version of the video you're watching as it's likely been updated. Now while Vorpex can sometimes be complicated, albeit frustrating, and while there's a good lot of games we've all tried to get working with it that failed miserably, Vorpex has also unearthed some absolute gold for virtual reality. It's my most used VR app to date, having allowed me to exist in dozens of different game worlds. When you know what you're doing, and you also know where you're going, Vorpex can be the single best thing to do in VR right now. With the recent addition of Direct VR, Vorpex is nearing perfection in terms of ease of use and while I've already benefited from its strengths before this edition, the new feature turned Vorpex into a major league player, making third-party VR as simple as it can ever get. It's time that I start documenting and sharing what I've learned from this extremely powerful tool, and I think this series will be the way. Now it's time to get started learning how to use Vorpex. The series will begin with the beginning. For this video, we'll be covering Vorpex configurations in general, without addressing any game in particular. This will serve as an excellent base to start with for most games you'll want to run with Vorpex. Now while we won't be covering any specific game, there will be many examples from different games featured in this general tutorial. You won't end this video with a plug-and-play ability for 100% of games that work with Vorpex, but you'll definitely be given enough leads to get configurations done very quickly in various scenarios. We'll be covering the process in 8 steps. Game preparation, Vorpex preparation, profile duplication, introduction to game settings, common settings, manual VR, direct VR, and finally, tips and known issues. Future videos in this series will each feature tutorials for specific games. Now I've tested over two dozen games with Vorpex and I already have a sort of hit list with results varying between good and excellent. The games are Shadow Warrior 2013, Bioshock Infinite, Singularity, Serious Sam 3 BFE, Fallout 4, Borderlands, Borderlands 2, Skyrim, Grand Theft Auto 5, Amnesia, Metro 2033, and not the Redux, Hard Reset, the original, not the enhanced edition, Portal 2, and Portal. Most of these games will eventually each be covered in this series. Before we start cracking open our VR toolbox and getting to work, I do want to bring up the theater mode briefly. 
This feature of Vorpex is quite excellent to run games that have working 3D but don't have any means of tracking your head movement. It's a curved virtual screen showing the game within another virtual environment. It can also come in handy to watch cutscenes and some might even like playing all their games like this. However, I won't be covering the theater much in this video, mostly because I don't have enough experience with it, having played most of my games in true VR. I did feel it was worthy bringing it up though, and I may make a video regarding this feature at a later date. Keep in mind that all the tutorials in this series, including this one, are designed to be headset independent, meaning if you have either an HTC Vive, an Oculus Rift, CV1 or DK2, or even a Razer HDK2, all the settings demonstrated should apply for you. Given Vorpex's recent improvements, it's much easier to port settings over from one headset to another, so there's no more need to individually cover each unit's procedures separately. At the beginning, there is a game. The game is installed, and now you want to play it in VR. Not so fast. You have to run the game at least once in 2D before you get to do that. Most games will write their configuration files the first time you run them, and they might even pop in a few important prerequisites on the way. In addition to allowing the game to settle in on your computer, you can take this opportunity to go on the game's options and change graphics settings where they're available. Having the game running in 2D on your desktop, go into the graphics options. Not all games will be flexible, but let's cover as many settings as we can right away. I'll mention the most important ones. If for some reason you can't find it in the game you're using, don't worry. You can always either break open the configuration files, or access values in the registry, or even use a third-party tool to force in some options. Always consult PC Gaming Wiki, link in the description, if there's a setting in the game that you can't find. First in the graphics settings is anti-aliasing. If MSAA is available in the game, high-end GPUs can run MSAA 4X at 1280 by 1024 and it will look about as good as 1600 by 1200 without any AA at all. It's a nice feature to have, but it's incredibly costly and it'll force you to trade off a lot of performance even at the higher end. Leave it off or use it with much caution. If any other AA method is available, only use it if you plan on running at the lower res of 1280x1024. With any higher resolution, artificial AA techniques won't be of much help and might go as far as blurring the image too much. For Vorpex, the best resolutions are either 4-3 or 5-4 aspect ratio. For simplicity, I'll present you with three very common options. For a low-end GPU, that being a 970 or less, use 1280 by 1024. For mid-level GPUs, being a 980 or a 1060, use 1400 by 1050. Finally, for high-end GPUs such as a 980 Ti or a 1070 or a 1080, you can go as high as 1600 by 1200. Resolution is effectively the setting that will impact performance the most, so be careful using higher resolution on under-spec GPUs. It'll often happen that you won't be able to find one of these exact resolutions. In that case, Pick the next closest resolution. For example, you'll often see 1600 by 1080, which is a great substitute for 1600 by 1200. In most cases, unless your monitor is 4.3, these games will require running in windowed mode. Windowed mode can sometimes come with mouse focus issues, causing your pointer to fly out of the game and click on your desktop or on another program. To prevent this, most games will have a borderless window mode, and some games, like Fallout 4, even have a topmost window option. Options like this should be checked or selected if they're available. Another problem that can arise is the game window will try to stretch to fill your desktop. Most times there is an option in the settings to prevent windowed mode from trying to fill the screen. 
Use it if you find it. With most games, again, there are a few unwanted graphics options you'll want to turn off. Some we even want to kill with fire. Your biggest enemy is motion blur. Make sure to have it off, or you're definitely not going to have a good time at all. Your next biggest enemy is V-Sync, or frame rate cap limit. V-Sync can cause a 2 to 3 frame lag in your game and cause the asynchronous time warp to overshoot insanely, giving a really floaty feeling. The next effect you want to disable is SSAO. It's not convincing for most games in VR and it costs your GPU a fortune to render. Turn it off. Depth of field is also undesirable. It's an expensive effect that will simply blur your view till you think you need glasses. Off is best in most cases. Be careful with shadows. For one, Vorpex will often need dynamic shadows forced off in order to avoid eyesores in Geometry 3D. It's one thing to have to render shadows in the first place, they're extremely costly, but it's another to render them and not even display them. Start at low. For a low-end GPU, turn them off if you can. If you're interested in improving them later, because you actually see them in the game and they're working properly, you can always revisit settings or tweak them in the configuration files of the game directly. The general rule of thumb is to take it easy on the settings. Start with low on underspec GPUs, and even on the higher end, I recommend you try medium range settings before rushing into high. Aside for options that consume purely memory, like texture quality and anisotropic filtering, most GPUs, including a 970, have plenty of memory. Those can be on ultra, but most other settings shouldn't be overdone too early in. Start with a conservative approach and keep in mind that things like shadows, particles and post-process effects are very costly. Typically, for a game to function properly in Geometry 3D, it needs to be run in DirectX 9 if the game can do it. Some other games will work fine in DirectX 11 thanks to Vorpex's recent improvements and other games might even require DirectX 11 for Geometry 3D to work. In the case of Shadow Warrior 2013, for example, the game installs two distinct copies, the DirectX 11 version, which doesn't work with Vorpex, and the DirectX 9 version, or Windows XP version as they call it, which works almost flawlessly with Vorpex. It comes down to a case-by-case -case basis, but in general, DirectX 9 is the preferable option, especially for unofficially supported games. While most games do have extensive settings, it's possible that with quite a few titles, you'll need to break the game's configuration files open, look for its keys in the registry, or even use a third-party plugin like Flawless Widescreen to force in some options like FOV and HUD tweaks. Again, it's worth taking the time to visit PC Gaming Wiki to see if there are any instructions to access the settings you need in order to prepare your game for Vorpex. Before we jump to Vorpex, it's important to define two distinct terms here. Manual VR and Direct VR. Vorpex is now designed to be nearly plug-and-play configuration, but it can't always pull it off given the different ways game engines work. The preferred, easiest way to run a game in VR is to go by Direct VR which is a mode that will automatically determine your field of view, the image density, the head tracking rate, and the positional tracking. However, DirectVR won't always work with every game. I'll be posting a list of games that are known to work with DirectVR at the moment of making this video, and I'll try to keep it up to date as much as possible. Now, if a game can't use DirectVR, or if aspects of the DirectVR ever fail for some reason, you can use the game the old way, which is what I like to now call Manual VR, a term that helps distinguish the mode from Direct VR. Manual VR takes more time, notably because you have to configure everything by hand, and getting a feel for adjusting something like a field of view can be really difficult and time-consuming. However, with the help of this tutorial, without going for any one game in particular, 
I'll give you enough leads to accelerate the process by a big margin. Manual VR has its downsides. Notably, you won't get a properly leveled pitch axis, but there are tricks to help with that that I'll mention at the end in the tips. The Vorpex settings optimizer is mostly meant for games that you'll be running in manual VR, but there are some tweaks it can apply to your game that will affect both modes, so listen up. If you're planning on using Direct VR, do this step but uncheck the FOV setting in all cases. Since we've already done resolution, you can go ahead and uncheck that too if it's present. For a manual VR game to work well, start with an FOV value of about 120. I've seen 125 working with many games, but it can vary and the range seems to be between 110 and 125 degrees depending on how the game calculates it. If you don't get this value perfect, there are Vorpex options inside the game that will help you finely tweak your FOV. 120 degrees is an excellent starting point. Leave latency optimization, direct 3D version, and other checked if they're present, even if you plan on using direct VR. You can go ahead and apply your settings by clicking Optimize Settings. Some games won't have a Settings Optimizer option and can require a bit more work to get going, such as modifying configuration files or using third-party tools like Flawless Widescreen to force the field of view. When the time comes to adjust your field of view in the game for manual VR, if you struggle to get close to something good, it may be that you've overshot or undershot the value in the settings optimizer. If you need to experiment, increase or decrease the value by 5 degrees at a time, not going under 100, nor going over 130 degrees. If a game isn't under local profiles, it isn't originally supported by Vorpex, but it might work with a little bit of experimentation. Vorpex has a feature where profiles can be duplicated in order to use the copy on another game. For example, recent Unity games seem to somewhat respond to the Firewatch local profile when running in DirectX 11. Sometimes it even results in working Geometry 3D. To do this, go in Local Profiles and pick your original source profile. For this example, I'll be applying the Firewatch profile to Slime Rancher. I'll click the Copy Profile button and rename it so I can tell which one is which. Once I've added the profile, I can then assign the unsupported game's executable to this new profile. I locate the Slime Rancher EXE file, assign it to the new profile, and voila! The next time I start Slime Rancher in DirectX 11 with Vorpex running, it will fire up using this profile. A side note on doing what I just demonstrated in this example using the Firewatch profile with Slime Rancher, I was surprised to find Geometry 3D working quite well, but very disappointed to see massive issues with the Skybot. I'll need to research more on that specific game if I ever want to bring it back in the mix. Copied profiles will not be featured in the settings optimizer, even if you use the profile that originally had one. This means that any tweaks, resolution changes, and most importantly, FOV settings must be applied through either the game's settings itself or through the configuration files if necessary. Again, flawless widescreen can come in really handy to force a game without an FOV setting to increase its FOV anyways. Whether you're using manual VR or direct VR, the following group of settings will apply. Most of the following settings will affect 3D modes and image output. We're going to be shooting for the most realistic world scale possible and the most balanced image output we can get. We've done the preliminary steps, now it's time to start your runtimes, whichever they may be, start Vorpex and finally fire up your game. Don't bring up any Vorpex settings until you've made your way into the game world. Either load a previous save or start a new game, let the opening movies and or scenes occur, 
wait for a moment where the game gives you free control and doesn't propose any challenge such as combat or attacks. At this point, you'll be left able to open your Vorpex settings and make changes without rude in-game interruptions. Heads up, this is especially hard to pull off with Claptrap shouting in the background. Once you're nicely set, press the delete key to bring up the Vorpex HUD. You're going to first want to take a look at the main settings section in the Vorpex settings HUD, notably at 3D reconstruction. 3D reconstruction is typically something you'll want to adjust after configuring your image output, field of view especially. But I'll cover the settings first because they apply for both manual VR and direct VR. You can do these settings first, then complete your manual slash direct VR config, and then come back here after to make final touches. There are four settings for 3D reconstruction. Z normal is the one you'll often find selected by default. And while it's not very good, it can serve as a fallback for older GPUs, as the game will be able to run much faster using this. Typically, you'll want to blast the strength setting to the max and put the depth weighing to absolute minimum. It's very hard to gauge if you've gotten your world scale correct with this option, since objects near you will appear to lose depth to them and seem to flatten as they get closer. So try to use something that appears to be more than 20 feet away from you for scale reference. If you find the objects in the world seem too small, lower the strength. This is rare as normally the depth strength will be weak and thus needs to be at the max. If you find that objects in the horizon look like nearby cardboard cutouts, your depth weighing is too strong, lower it if you can. Depth in very distant objects should not be discernible. Although using Z normal can help with performance, it's really not recommended, it may not work, and if you have a higher end system, geometry is immediately preferable. But in some odd cases, it can work uncharacteristically well. Like for example, with GTA 5, which up till recently only supported Z normal, looked pretty damn good despite having to use Z normal. Although now, GTA 5 does support Geometry 3D. With some games, you'll also see a focal offset option. If you find you've got good 3D going, but it's somewhat hard on the eyes, you will likely see this option. I had to use a little bit in Fallout 4, for example. It's not common, but if you do see that setting show up, odds are you'll have to play with it. The next option in the list is Z Adaptive. Z Adaptive is similar to Z Normal, but as its name suggests, it will adaptively adjust the depth according to a given scene. This has proven to help with depth in nearby objects, a weakness of Z Normal. But the problem with Z Adaptive is that it performs the number one crime of any artificial 3D reconstruction. The world scale will vary constantly, which can work against VR immersion. This is a setting I can actually not even recommend, and I'm gonna go ahead and skip it. The next option in the list is Geometry 3D. This is the option everyone wants. Even if your game is struggling a bit with Geometry 3D due to GPU limitations, most people will agree it's better to spare a bit on frame rate and get authentic 3D instead. That's right, Geometry 3D is for real. Instead of artificially reconstructing the stereoscopic image, it actually films the game world in true stereoscopic 3D. This means that suddenly the game is using two in-game cameras and thus, the demand on performance doubles. But the end result is a very believable, true-to-life version of the game world you're looking at. Typically, you'll want the separation strength at 0.7. It can vary from game to game very slightly, but for the most part, it's a great starting point that will immediately work about 70% of the time. An example of an exception would be Borderlands 1, where the setting had to come as low as 0.4 for anything in the game world not to look like it's toy-sized. 
the best reference to verify if you've gotten your separation strength correctly is to find a human model in the game and stand next to it. It's the most easily recognizable figure for anyone and will make any misconfigured scale apparent. The lower the separation is, the larger things will seem, the more massive. And the higher the separation, the smaller things will look. They'll kind of look toy-like. Geometry 3D enables the ability to force enlarge the FOV. This can come in very handy for games that don't allow you to increase the FOV at all, but the feature may very well cause glitches. A very well known issue being objects outside of your center FOV will keep popping in and out of existence. The FOV boost can be of great use for cases where you need just a slight tiny boost to make up for a setting you got wrong or a limit in the game's ability to blast the FOV. Always try plugins like Flawless Widescreen for FOV boosting before you resort to any 3D FOV boost. The last option in the 3D reconstructions is off. If a game needs to run with the off option, best just not play it in VR at all. This is an option you never want to have to fall back to as it eliminates all world scale and thus kills immersion completely. I'm obviously not going to cover this one. Next, another couple of settings that are common to direct or manual VR found under image settings would be crystal image and G3D shadow treatment. First, crystal image is a process that attempts to increase the sharpness of the image. In some games it'll improve the visuals, but in others it might actually damage them. The feature has three options, off, normal, and aggressive. Adjust them to your preference from game to game, but keep in mind that off may give you a performance boost as it makes the process go dormant. G3D shadow treatment is what I like to call eyesore control. If you find that shadows are rendering at the wrong depth, like they hurt the eyes when you look at them, then you may want to set this option to turn off. In some games, auto has proven to work best, but at most times, especially with DirectX 11 games, you'll need to use the turn off option. Finally, for the common settings, we have Direct Mode Fluid Sync under Display Settings. If you're using a lower-end GPU, you may want to experiment with this option, but with higher-end hardware, for most games, you'll want to make sure this option is off. Fluid Sync essentially forces the game to cap at 45 frames per second and relies on the asynchronous time warp doing the rest of the work. It's fairly ineffective in some cases and can produce serious motion sickness due to immense frame lag. It's a matter of preference in some cases. In cases like, for instance, amnesia, it's actually necessary to use it, but in most cases I've tested, especially with a GTX 1080, I had better results with it off. At this point in time, it's safe to assume that a majority of games will not support direct VR. Again, I'll be putting a list of the games that do in the description of this video, and hopefully with time, the list will grow, eventually covering almost all games. If direct VR is not supported, it's up to you to adjust everything yourself, from field of view to head tracking, hence the term manual VR. First step of properly configuring manual VR is the field of view. It's the most important part. Fortunately, the settings between games will vary little to none, so it's easy to give an overall starting point. Remember, we use the settings optimizer to force the field of view at about 120 degrees. If the game you're running doesn't have a settings optimizer, do make sure you've either set the field of view to 120 degrees in the game's options in its config files or by using a tool like Flawless Widescreen. Considering you can run with a field of view of 120 or near, there's just one thing to do for the FOV. Go in the Image Settings pane 
go down to image zoom and change that value to 0 0.95. This will squeeze the image just enough for the 120 degree field of view to work and will avoid downscaling to the point where you see any edges. The value of 0 0.9 also increases pixel density a bit, which can help a lot with in-game aliasing. However, you'll start to see slight edges. If you're using a tool like Flawless Widescreen, it's possible that you can't see what exactly your FOV value is, although you'll be able to adjust it anyways. In that case, you're going to need to visually gauge your settings. The same goes for if you have no means of increasing the in-game FOV value at all. In this case, if the game is using Geometry 3D, you'll be able to use 3D FOV boost paired with image zoom in order to balance the perspective. In the case where you're using Z normal 3D reconstruction or no 3D at all, you'll need to be able to force the game's FOV with other means than Vorpex as the 3D FOV boost isn't available unless you're running in Geometry 3D. If you need to adjust a field of view visually because you can't see what the game's actual field of view value is, example with flawless widescreen, the rule of thumb is if the image looks like it's swaying left and right when you turn your head, the FOV is too large. Then, if you get the sensation that your face is being stuffed into the scenery, it means your field of view is too small or too tight. Be careful, we haven't configured our head tracking yet, so don't mistake incorrect head tracking for bad FOV. At this point, using your mouse to gently turn side to side is a good way to check your field of view. In cases where the game is hopeless and has absolutely no means of forcing field of view at all, you can still try reducing image zoom in image settings. Below 0.9, you'll start seeing pretty visible edges, and as you reach 0.8, it'll start looking more like you have a screen in front of you rather than being fully immersed in the world. Still though, if you like the game enough, this can be a good fallback solution. Next, the head tracking under head tracking settings. Considering you've configured your field of view properly, or at least very, very close to, this step is easy. It can take a few tries, but the process itself is simple. We're going to do a shoulder to shoulder trick. Now, the trick I like to use to manually adjust head tracking is something I like to call the shoulder to shoulder trick. It basically involves turning your head 90 degrees either way and seeing if the in-game rotation is doing the same thing. And of course, you can adjust accordingly. Now, it's kind of hard to tell if your head is really doing 90 degrees left and right with a headset on, especially when the game's head tracking is wrong. It can be actually a little confusing. And this is where the shoulder to shoulder trick comes in. What you want to do is, you want to turn your head to the left and put your hand under your chin to see when your head lines up with your left shoulder. Repeat the same process for the right side. So by doing this, you'll be sure that you're actually rotating 90 degrees and you can probably see that my in-game head tracking is obviously too strong because my in-game head is turning by like 140 degrees. So it's time to bring up the setting. And right now, mine is 0 0.7. What I recommend doing when you lower the setting or increase it, work initially in increments of 0 0.1. So I'm going to lower to 0 0.6 right now and repeat the process. As you can see, it's still too strong. We're going to go for another decimal point. Now we're at 0 0.5. As you can see, I'm getting awfully close. This is looking like a hundred-ish degrees. I'm probably good for my final adjustment. 
that when you get close like this, either a little over or a little under, it's time to start working instead of increments of 0 0.1, in increments of 0 0.05. So I am a little above right now, I'm going to go down to 0.45. If I was a little under, I could try 0.55. 0.45 might actually do it. And then from there, if you find it still a little too strong like mine, you can actually go ahead and just do some final little tweaks there. And look at that. We have one-to-one -one head tracking. So, the shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder trick, they definitely look odd, but uh, I can guarantee you that it is one of the best methods to adjust your head tracking to a one-to-one -one value. From this point, now that you know that your head tracking is correct, continue turning your head side to side like this after, because this will actually make an incorrectly adjusted FOV very obvious now that your head tracking is correct. It's going to be much easier for you to spot the little imperfections you have left. And you can go ahead, if you need to, go back to the main settings, either use some 3D FOV enhancement if you need some in order to boost it, or what you can also do is just play with the image zoom setting in order to do your final tweaks. So in my case it's at 0.95. Always opt to tinker with image zoom before ever using any 3D field of view boost if you do any adjustments at all. If you find yourself struggling to get a correct field of view, even with high 3D FOV boost values and low image zoom values, it means the game's FOV is set too low. If you find yourself increasing image zoom past 1.0, it means the field of view value you set for the game is too high, or maybe even the 3D field of view boost is too high. If you're using any 3D FOV boost, or lowering image zoom below 0.95, do consider going back to the game's field of view configuration if possible, and adjust the setting in increments of 5 degrees. Reload the game, then lower the 3D FOV boost and raise the image zoom back to 0.95 to see if you finally got a better setting at the core. Sure, the game might work by using image zoom or 3D FOV boost, but it's better to consider these two options as a guide as to whether you didn't set enough FOV or too much FOV when you first configured the game. Last but not least, a couple of extras. It's possible that positional tracking may cause issues in some given games. Do experiment by toggling it on and off. The setting is under head tracking settings. Also, I recommend in manual VR mode to disable mouse acceleration under mouse and gamepad settings. With the following settings, you should be on your way to enjoying VR that lands somewhere between good and great, depending on the game. In my case, the best manual VR results were with Shadow Warrior 2013 and Serious Sam 3 BFB. The major downside that remains when using manual VR, even when absolutely properly configured, is you will often get a mismatched pitch. This means that while your head will be level in real life, the in-game view will be either looking up or looking down. This can completely ruin a good third-party VR experience, and I'll give you a tip to help with that at the end of the video in the tips section. So you're about to load a game that's on Vorpex's official direct VR list, well, you're in luck because in most cases, Direct VR is capable of freaking magic. Given you've gone through the common settings already, now you can just hop into the Direct VR section of the Vorpex HUD and go ahead and run a Direct VR scan. I know there's also a hotkey for this, but I've seen the hotkey trigger a menu or an in-game action that would interfere with the DirectVR scan itself in some games. 
I recommend using the button in the HUD to perform your scan to be safe. The game will attempt up to three scans based on what it supports. Rotation, position, and field of view. Should any of these three scans fail, normally DirectVR will keep the features that successfully scanned active. For example, if the field of view scan fails somehow, both rotation and positional will still be functional, and thus you'll only have to adjust your field of view. On scan failures, it's very possible that an element of a direct VR scan fails, while a simple retry will have it succeed. A pointer I can give on this is the scan will almost always fail during a game's cutscenes, and it doesn't seem to like the player standing too close to a wall. Place yourself in the open, in a situation that requires no action in the game, and run your scan there. With all the games I've tried as of making this video, Bioshock Infinite, Fallout 4, and Borderlands 2, while I've had the odd failure here and there, I've always been able to get all the features working after minimal effort. If the field of view scan fails, it's not the end of the world. If you have access to the field of view settings of the game and Vorpex's field of view boost and image zoom options, refer to the manual VR section in this video to learn how to adjust it. Considering your rotational scan and positional scan worked, it's way easier to manually configure your field of view with correct head tracking. With the full direct VR feature set, the VR becomes incredibly close to first-party implementations, as now your in-game view will always match your real head position. In addition to this, the field of view and positional should be spot-on without having to do any work. The only manual configuration required is Geometry 3D Separation Strength, which almost always needs to be lowered to 0.7 or less, in order to avoid the game world from looking toy figurine sized. But aside from that, there's no further input required on your part at this point. Downsides you should expect of DirectVR are slight flickering on some UI elements, moments where the rotation is forced back and forth between the game and DirectVR, and some rare field of view shifting. For the most part, they are harmless, and from recent tests I've done, critical issues with DirectVR do seem to have been eliminated overall. So go ahead and play after a successful scan because you're pretty much done here. Before we close off, I've got a few tips and known issues to talk about with both modes. Hand models in 3D are often at the wrong depth or just plain too large or just downright wrong. Good hand models are rare to come by with third-party VR. I've seen them, for instance, in Bioshock Infinite. I believe Dishonored is another game that has them pretty good. Shadow Warrior is close, but they're still too large. Fallout has them too deep, so it's really a bit all over the place, but if you get lucky, you might get some good hand models. It does make the experience a lot better. With manual VR, you're going to have problems keeping your own head's Y-axis matching the in-game's head's Y-axis, the pitch. This can really disorient, even make you pretty dizzy. There are several tricks to address this, but my personal favorite is the pitch locked mouse. I basically purchased a mechanical ball mouse <laughs> ball, and blocked the vertical axis sensor inside, turning the mouse into a yaw only input or an X axis only input, thus making Vorpex's head tracking the only thing capable of sending Y-axis input to the game I'm playing. This improves the situation a lot with many games, and while some drifting will remain, to date it's the best way I've found to eliminate as much pitch offset as possible. 
I keep my real mouse nearby during gameplay for if I want to readjust the pitch in case an offset forms, which even with this trick will happen regularly. Vorpex does have a non-direct VR pitch locking option to help with this, but it's nowhere near as effective as it drifts like crazy and will way too often require readjustments. If you found a game you really like to play in VR and are facing the drifting pitch problem, my top recommendation is trying the modified mechanical mouse. With direct VR, the pitch issue is non-existent. But you'll notice that when you move your mouse up and down, Vorpex seems to fight the pitch for a bit. This can be a little bit off-putting, and if you want to eliminate this effect, my pitch lock mouse trick is also a very good solution. Some have recommended using software to lock the mouse cursor on the vertical axis, but this is not always a very good solution as it can completely lock out the pitch, even from your head tracking, which is probably worse than having pitch offsets. The gamepad will work, but I don't recommend it. Both thumbstick head rotation and mouse head rotation will feel weird at first. The huge difference here is you'll easily be able to adapt to mouse rotation, while thumbstick rotation will continuously give you a wretched, unnatural feeling. I highly recommend taking the time to get used to mouse rotation as it really will pay off down the line. Some may think the gamepad will resolve the pitch issue, but it doesn't. First off, you need some y-axis input in order to be able to adjust any offset that builds up. And second, the y-axis on a gamepad is as easy to accidentally hit as a mouse's y-axis, so you're left in pretty much the same situation. An extra little tip here, if you want to know the game's internal frame rate, and the frame rate after a synchronous time warp is applied, Vorpex has a built-in frame rate counter that is capable of counting both rates. Go ahead and press Alt and F while running any game with Vorpex. Sometimes it won't respond the first shot because the game has an action on the Alt key. But press it once or twice, eventually it'll respond, and you can tap it a few times again to make the counter go away. This is a little extra section I like to call the cheat sheet, because we've gone through a lot of instructions and I figured I could crunch everything into a really short list of things to check for. Here we go, the whole process in a nutshell. Run and configure your game at a 4-3 aspect ratio, 1280 by 1024 for low, 1400 by 1050 for medium, and 1600 by 1200 for high. Easy on the graphics settings, shadows cost a lot and might not work. Make sure motion blur is off, MSAA is nice but super costly. Run the Vorpex optimizer or make yourself a profile. Don't apply resolution, and if you plan on using direct VR, don't apply FOV either. For manual VR, get the game to work at a field of view of 120 degrees or around that, either with the settings optimizer or the game's config files or a third-party tool. For the best 3D, you want Geometry 3D, which will work well at a separation strength of 0.7 most of the time. Somewhere around that number should always work. If you're stuck without Geometry, Use Z-Normal Reconstruction with Depth Strength on Max and Weighing at Minimum. If you're running Manual VR at a field of view of 120, put the Image Zoom setting at 0.95. If you feel like your game world is far from you, your field of view is too large. If you feel like your face is being shoved in the game world, your field of view is too small. Shadow eyesores can be turned off by toggling the G3D shadow treatment setting to off. If your asynchronous time warp feels too aggressive or your frame rate appears to be locked at 45 frames per second, check the fluid sync option. If it's on, it will be capping at 45 frames per second. Direct VR will not require doing any manual configuration other than 3D, G3D shadow treatment, and checking that fluid sync is off. The best way to fight pitch axis mismatching is by using a modified mechanical mouse that does not respond on the pitch axis. 
Motion controls will never really fit into third-party VR, but thankfully they're kind of a little bit overrated. Their absence will in no way diminish your VR experience as all you need to experience good virtual reality is the headset itself. Using your mouse and keyboard will in no way take away from what you can experience. This guide was designed to cover as many scenarios as possible in one shot. So while it covers a lot of bases, it's not perfectly adapted for all games. This tutorial is the start of a new series of videos. The videos that follow this one will each cover one specific game and may refer to this one for any general settings. What you've seen here is pretty much my own approach to most games. Take this as a necessary starting point before you watch any future game specific videos. If ever any video in this series is updated, the older version of the video will be tagged as outdated between brackets at the start of the title. If you see this, look for a link to the new version of the tutorial in the description. This method will apply to all videos in this Vorpex series, so if a game gets its tutorial updated, its old video will link to the new one as well. This will help keep track of the tutorials and make linking people to the videos far easier. And up until now, the only way to find my tutorials was to dig through my Let's Play series hoping to find the part where I did one. And that didn't guarantee you'd found the latest one. This new series will definitely organize the information a lot better. From here on, Vorpex Let's Play parts will have links to a tutorial for their respective games, provided it's available. Also, as I make the videos for each individual game, I'll make a list of links to each tutorial in this very video's description, given you're pretty much watching the parent video of the series. Expect to see a playlist on my channel for this series as well, along with playlists for all my Let's Plays of Vorpex games. Vorpex initially improved a lot when it had its own asynchronous time warp worked in during the development days of VR. It's since enabled me to relive absolute gems, the stuff of a VR gamer's dreams, really. Being able to exist in many game worlds that I had initially grown fond of before the dawn of virtual reality. Shadow Warrior 2013 was an absolutely stunning VR experience, proving that even manual VR can pull off wonders. To date, my copy of Vorpex likely has over 250 hours of usage, maybe even more. I've often run tests without recording, did some sessions that were never published, and even ran a bit of non-Steam stuff that I can't keep track of hour counts on. For under 50 bucks, it's actually pretty unbelievable. Since even though it cannot enable VR in all the games that exist, it has at least 30 titles that can be run in VR with excellent degrees of success, and will thus expand your VR library in one shot for a relatively pretty low price. I've seen a lot of people misuse Vorpix and quickly toss an incorrect judgment down a staircase out of frustration, but know that these individuals' conclusions are wrong. If you know what you're doing, and you know where you're going, you will have great results with this tool. Even in cases where you try an obscure game that's not supported, you may, in some cases, pull off interesting results, close enough to unexpectedly enjoy yet another game world in VR. Look, I've been in mysterious Japanese towns covered in demons, in the Middle East being chased by skeleton wolves, in the arid badlands shooting skags, been to Colombia walking on clouds, to post-nuclear apocalyptic alternate universe Boston, and many, many other places. So many through all the tests that I cannot recall them off the top of my head. Vorpex is like a VR private jet that lets you fly into a shit ton of game worlds. It's also more than just VR tourism. In most places you go, there's also a game to play, and it's probably not a fucking wave shooter. The main turnoff for Vorpex is the time it can take to configure a game. 
For me, this process started by taking a little over an hour, sometimes two. However, since I've sort of gotten the hang of most elements, a new game can take me as little as 15 minutes to configure now. Toss in direct VR in the mix and we're down to just over 5 minutes. This video should help you reach the same type of setup time. Once you get the hang of basic elements explained in this feature, you'll be on your way to doing your own experimentation, I'm sure. As when the basics become easy, trying stuff becomes extremely tempting. That's it for now. Expect for the series of game-specific videos to start soon. I'm likely going to revisit Shadow Warrior 2013 first. That one has a fully completed Let's Play series on the channel, and while it uses manual VR, I'm very familiar with it and it's not hard to set up. Something I'm putting first in line. Until then, I hope the speed you took at the beginning of the video still has some effect and that you haven't fallen asleep. At least this wasn't done on the tone of ASMR. Probably would have lost you halfway. Thanks for watching, folks. I'll see you next time.